Mario and Luigi, and not that one. Amazing. At least it can't get any worse, right? Yeah, I'm playing Dream Team soon. Everyone's been saying it's really good, but I'm not expecting too much. One week later. Yes, it's true. I love Mario & Luigi Dream Team. After my last video on Paper Jam, I was surprised to see so much support for Dream Team in the comments. Originally, I thought the game was almost a blemish on an otherwise amazing series. But on replay, it's become one of my favorite 3DS games. Of course it's not perfect, but there were a lot of things I thought Dream Team did not only great, but even better than any other game in the series. And I'm really excited to highlight all of these. So without further ado, this is How Good Was Mario & Luigi Dream Team. The story takes place in, drumroll please, not Mushroom Kingdom. Unique locations, creative character designs, and no Paper Toads. Paper Mario has nothing to do with this game, but that's beside the point. We got Pillow Guys. We got Block Guys. We have a race of tiny little creatures with cute head decorations that speak in a funny manner. Hell, we even have chubby characters. We are so back. We drop in Pilo Island where Mario and Luigi team up with Prince Dreambert to travel between the real world and dream world, free the petrified Pilo folk, and stop Bowserin and Tasma before they can make their dream of world domination come true. The game takes moments of epic fantasy and combines it with classic Mario and Luigi shenanigans. It's unique as hell, has hilarious writing, it's fun, and I love it. You know what else I love? You can tell Dream Team put a lot of thought into its battle system. In the Mario & Luigi games, Bro's attacks are kind of incentivized because they're your most significant sources of damage and are the most interactive attacks you have. Interactive battles, of course, are one of the main appeals of the series. Unlike with other games in the series, Dream Team is really well balanced, as I feel like there's not a singular Bro's attack that's way too overpowered. Other games had infinite hits and super high damage AoE, that essentially acted as screen wipes or even one-hit KOs on bosses. Granted, these attacks are walled off until later in the game, but when you finally do unlock them, they trivialize two or three of the hardest dungeons. If you look at the bros attacks in Dream Team, you notice that it no longer includes any extended multi-hit or true multi-target moves. The closest things you have to that are the Fire Flower and the Bomb Derby both of which have pretty balanced restrictions. Because the fights are more balanced and don't revolve around spamming one or two attacks, there's more room for different strategies and creativity during battle as well. One of the options for that creativity are badges. Badges in this form were originally introduced in Bowser's Inside Story. The badge meter fills with each successful attack, and when it's full, you can activate an in-battle bonus effect. Dream Team took this system and perfected it. It increased the amount of badges and the different types of effects. It also allowed you to stockpile these effects and re-equip badges mid-battle for different combinations. Even out of battle, there was new gear introduced in the game that focused on badge effect and meter strength. Dream Team turned a simple bonus mechanic into a legitimate strategy that ended up being one of my favorite additions to the game. I could go on for another 10 minutes on badges alone, wink wink, hinting at a future video, 
but now it's time to dip into the dream world. Unlike in real world battles, dream battles have 10 to sometimes 15 plus enemies in a single encounter. These large groups of enemies have complex, coordinated attacks that push defense to the limit while still being fun and interactive. Dream battles also put a new spin on offense with the introduction of Dreamy Luigi. Dreamy Luigi powers up Mario, giving him the ability to target multiple enemies doing 10 plus times the amount of normal damage. Mario also unlocks Luiginary attacks that take bros attacks and put them in an overdrive. They are the most powerful, flashy, and creative attacks in the game, using hundreds of Dreamy Luigis in order to form huge weapons to attack large groups of enemies. Overall, Dreams, Luigi, Dreamy Luigi, all epic. Dream Team does include another battle system specific to the Dream World in the form of Giant Battles. Giant Battles, once again, take something introduced in Bowser's Inside Story and improve it. I don't, however, think Dream Team changed Giant Battles to the same extent that it did for Badges. Giant Battles are a bit more the same. Probably the biggest difference is the addition of Giant Bros attacks. But overall, I feel like if it weren't for how cinematic and story-driven these giant battles were, they would end up feeling like overblown minigames. And for me, since I was forced to play on an emulator, I couldn't even get the full experience of these minigames. Using a monitor and mouse for tilt and touch controls wasn't great, and certain mechanics, such as the final phase of Giant Bowser, were actually impossible without using save states. Even with all the problems I had surrounding giant battles, they were a nice break from normal gameplay, and combined with normal and dream battles, I had fun throughout my entire playthrough. From here on out though, I definitely will do future playthroughs on an actual 3DS. Alright, we have made it through the first part of this video. And before we get to the next section, let's give a quick round of applause for Dream Team. A lot of the issues I had with Paper Jam just are not present in this game. Battles are fun, the story is unique and interesting. Shoutouts all around. I'm putting this part in just to remind everyone that I really like this game. Unfortunately, it's now time to go mask off and talk about the parts of the game that really ruffled my feathers. Starting with the obvious. I don't know, five minutes, is it five? Yeah, yes, five! Five minutes before this planet explodes, and you perish along with it. Oh. Pacing is to Dream Team as Paper Toads are to Paper Jam. Most people, including myself, agree that this game has a big problem with pacing for a multitude of reasons. The game straight up takes way longer than it should. It had a really slow start, taking me two hours just to get to the first real boss, and unlock bros attacks. Like I said earlier, combat, bros attacks, it's such an important part of Mario & Luigi games. Without them, especially earlier on like in Dream Team, battles would drag on, and having to go through two whole dungeons just jumping on enemies was not great. Luckily, the game picks up after this, but getting over that first two-hour hump full of cutscenes and tutorials was a struggle. Speaking of which, tutorials are Dream Team's most infamous pacing problem. The beginning of the game, of course, is full of tutorials. And granted, there are a lot of new and complex mechanics introduced to this game. The problem is, 10 hours, 20 hours, maybe 30 hours into your playthrough, the game is still force-feeding you tutorials, even for simple mechanics. It's hand-holdy, it cuts into the story, and is just unneeded. 
randomly there was a new tutorial for the Luiginary Raft work, which I was both pleasantly surprised with and also triggered by when I realized it wasn't the end of tutorials. They just forgot to put this one in for some reason. Like I said, tutorials are definitely the most infamous issue, but they aren't my number one issue with pacing. That award goes to something that has nothing to do with the actual progression of the game. It's time to talk about the size of Dream Team. No, it's not the amount of content in the game, or the amount of memory in the cartridge. I'm talking about the straight up girth of these maps. Traversing the overworld is a pain because Mario and Luigi are so small compared to the surrounding area, and there's no movement options other than their slow paced walking. Luckily, all the areas in the game are visually appealing and interesting, but exploring these huge maps and getting from point A to point B can be awful, especially when fast travel in the form of golden pipes doesn't exist until the final stretch of the game. I personally blame the switch to the 3D art style, as with a new console came the ability to create more visually grand scenery. Basically, Nintendo wanted to flex their new 3DS. It's a real shame, since a lot of the pacing issues could have been fixed with a fast forward button or a dash mechanic, but things like that would still be years away for the series. Next up on the hate train, we have... Okay, okay. I know I opened this video talking about how the story was unique and fun and had all these great designs. And all of that is still true. There's just one glaring issue that I could not get over. And that is Bowser. For the first time in Mario & Luigi history, Bowser took the reins as the main antagonist. And before all the Antasma stands come at me, let me explain. Antasma is introduced as this big baddie of the Pielo Kingdom, but eventually teams up with Bowser. The issue is Bowser is not only introduced too early in the game, but long overstays his welcome, eventually one-upping Antasma becoming the final boss. Bowser's inclusion really undermines Antasma's standing as a good villain. If you take a deep look at his story, Antasma has all the makings of an epic villain and character in general. A weakling turned corrupted demon king who broke out of his hundred year imprisonment, commanding an ancient magical artifact with the ability to petrify his enemies, seeking revenge through world domination. All of this, on top of a crazy cool design, sounds epic I know. Antasma could have been goaded but never really established himself as an actual threat. If you look at these villains from previous games, they all have an overbearing presence that persists throughout the entire story. Antasma, on the other hand, barely has any screen time or even mentions. And when he does show up, he's playing support for Bowser. Because of this, Bowser steals the show, and even though his final boss fight was the best fight in the entire game, it was still just Bowser being Bowser. The entire plot of the game turned into a TLDR, Bowser Kidnaps Peach. And while other games have a B-plot with Bowser, it always stays just the B-plot. When Bowser is included, the story becomes more of the same old Super Mario formula, which if unchecked, can become deadly. Luckily, the Dream Team story overall was great. It was just really disappointing they had this cool ass character and replaced him for the sake of a mediocre twist at the very end. Justice for Antasma. Now I think I should end this video talking about a very important time in Nintendo's history. Dream Team was actually released almost exactly 10 years to this day, during the year of Luigi. 
2013 was celebrating 30 years since Luigi's original debut. Throughout this year, a bunch of Luigi-focused games were released, one of them being Dream Team. Unfortunately, I feel like Nintendo dropped the ball with most of these games. Many of them ended up falling short of expectations, becoming black sheeps of their respective series, or were straight up commercial failures. Honestly, I think Dream Team was the greatest thing to come out of the year of Luigi, and it's a little poetic since the Mario & Luigi series and Mario RPG games as a whole were the games that made Luigi the character we know today. Many people point to Luigi's Mansion as the origin of Luigi's character, and while it's true that the game introduced Luigi as a bit of a scaredy cat with a heart of gold, the Mario RPGs are the ones that really fleshed him out. Paper Mario was actually the origin of Luigi's fear of ghosts, funny enough. Superstar Saga and its sequels gave Luigi more personality than anything at the time and anything yet to come. It all culminates with the release of Dream Team, which shows the inner mechanisms of Luigi's mind. You get to see Luigi's love for his brother and his want to be heroic and good. And as the game progresses, you get to see him grow into that strong-willed hero that he's always wanted. While he doesn't have the opportunity to be the hero as often as other Nintendo icons, Luigi has cemented himself as one of, if not, the greatest character in the Nintendo universe that even Bowser himself has to acknowledge. After hating on Paper Jam in my last video, I vowed to go into Dream Team with an open mind so I could accurately assess it for my ranking. It just so happens that I would unknowingly spend Dream Team's 10 year anniversary replaying the game for the first time since release. There was so much about the game that I didn't remember and I was pleasantly surprised after experiencing it all over again. I loved so much of the game, but there were some parts that were not up to par. Issues like tutorials and slow pacing stuck in my mind for a decade, so while it's something I was generally okay with this time around, it is unarguable that these issues exist and were detrimental as a whole. So to answer the question, how good was Mario & Luigi Dream Team? If I take into account everything I just talked about, I would say Dream Team is... good. I'm really glad that I gave this game a second chance, and I'm thankful to all these people that like these videos, because it motivates me to give all these games a second look. Up next, I'm continuing my trek through the Mario & Luigi series, so stay tuned.